Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Heal Your Natural Wellness podcast. Today, my guest is the phenomenal Dr. Gene. Uh, he has been practicing dentistry for over 40 years with special interest in orthodontists, dental orthopedics, temporomandibular joint disorder, sleep disorder, breathing, and implantology. He graduated from the University of Maryland School of Dentistry in 1980 and soon after started incorporating a more holistic approach to his practice. Dr. Sam strives to educate his patients on how they can make healthier decisions in their lives, as well as sharing his knowledge around toxic-free dentistry, which avoids mercury, fil mercury, mercury amalgam fillings, fluoride in toxic root canals. Nearly 80% of all illnesses can be connected to infections, toxicities, and imbalances in the mouth, which is one of the reasons he's so passionate about practicing biological or holistic dentistry. A few of his affiliations include the Academy of General Dentistry, the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine, the International Academy of Biological Dentistry and Medicine, the Holistic Dental Association, and the International Dental Implant Association. He is also a board member of the Maryland Society of Integrative Medicine and the author of the book, Stop the Snore, Dental Solutions to Healthy Sleep, which we'll, we'll get into it at the end of the show. Welcome to the Healing and Natural Wellness Podcast, Dr. Jean. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invite. Well, Absolutely. Thanks it's, for the uh, um, introduction too. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, we, I am very impressed with your credentials, but most importantly with your work. Uh, we just got acquainted. Uh, I was following actually for a while, but I didn't see you uh, on Instagram. You know how they hide us the our community but uh, I love your work and that's why you're here I think my audience is absolutely going to love you you are very knowledgeable in your field so uh, without further ado we're going to get right into it okay let's do that awesome so why don't you briefly tell us about your journey as a biological dentist in in biological dentistry dental sleep medicine and your passion surrounding it wow that's a long it's a long journey <laughs> <laughs> it started with the fairly traditional practice, you know, as, as you said, I graduated in 1980, then uh, I did a one-year residency at a hospital, University of Maryland Hospital, then I went into private practice. I worked as an associate doing traditional dentistry, placing mercury fillings, doing root canals, uh, exactly what, you know, we were indoctrinated to do from dental school, and uh, about 1985 or 86, uh, a very close friend of mine, was uh, diagnosed with uh, stage four melanoma. Uh, they gave him three to six months to live. Mm. And um, I'll just make a long story short. He's still alive today. So Excellent. They told him three to six months. He said, I'm going to pursue alternative therapies, which he did. He went out to the West Coast. He went to, uh, I believe it's called Livingston Wheeler Clinic, which is no longer there. Did some alternative treatment. Um, Anyway, so obviously it was it was a successful treatment. Um, so he was stubborn enough to say, no, I'm not doing chemo and I'm doing radiation. Uh, they didn't give him a lot of hope. Uh, but the most important thing for me, besides the fact that he's still alive, is that um, he said it was very interesting when he walked into the clinic. The first thing they asked him was to open his mouth. And he looked in his mouth and he said, you got a bunch of silver fillings. They need to come out. The, the treatment or therapies that we're going to do will not be as effective if we have to deal with these heavy metals that are constantly tox toxifying your or causing toxicity to your body. Wow. So it was a, that was an eye opener for me, especially since I was placing mercury fillings. I started to feel a little guilty, like, what am I doing to my patient? <laughs> so right. I had no idea this is what we were taught. So fortunately, how the, you know how the universe works in strange ways, I found this book because you know, we didn't have the internet then. It was called It's All in Your Head by Dr. Hal Huggins, uh, so who became my mentor. He was really the leading pioneer in this whole movement uh, against mercury amalgam. He was practicing in Colorado Springs. I read the book soon right after I, I, I actually remember being on a plane with my wife, who's my hygienist. I said, I think we're, you know, we're killing our patients. We need to take a look at this. So I called Dr. Hal Huggins. I said, hey, I'm in Maryland. Can I come out to Colorado and study with you? And so that was the beginning of the journey. So once I went down that path, there was no turning back. 
So along with that came interest in many other aspects of dentistry that weren't really taught with any in-depth uh, knowledge in dental school. So, um, so after doing that, I, I mean, I just basically switched my practice. I mean, I, I called my dental rep. The next day I said, hey, I need you to come in and remove all the mercury supplies out of my office. I'm no longer placing mercury. Wow. I studied with Dr. Hal Huggins and learned a very, very specific protocol, which we still use today. Uh, we talked a little bit about that before in terms of protecting the patient, protecting myself and protecting my assistant. You know, so that that led from one thing to another. I started to understand the importance of nutrition and how important that was in terms of keeping uh, patients' mouths healthy. And, I, you know, I really got into the whole kind of mind, body, spirit, but but really oral cavity and systemic health. What was the relationship? And I found there was a dual relationship between systemic health and how it affects your mouth. For example, someone who has diabetes, you can probably see bleeding gums. Someone who has periodontal disease, they're more likely to have diabetes. So there was a direct connection. So we started introducing nutrition into the practice. Then I started looking at, um, how could I uh, take a different look from orthodontics? Traditional orthodontics was to take out four teeth, retract all the teeth back. So I started to study dental orthopedics using specific types of appliances to help expand the arches and prevent the need for extracting teeth. So, so then I started looking at, well, how does extracting teeth affect the TMJ? So the temporal mandibular joint. So see how this continue. I was like, is this ever going to end? Or is this, <laughs> I got to take it's another just... course. I got to do some more study. So then I started looking at TMJ. And as from that, someone said, well, if you're studying TMJ, then you need to understand the cranial sacral system. I'm like, what is the cranial sacral system? So I started to study that. And I went to Upledger Institute and I studied with him. And in the mid nineties, we started looking at snoring as being a issue a problem that could be treated by dentistry. So we started to fabricate these anti-snoring devices, uh, unbeknownst to us exactly what we were really doing because at that point in time, we did not have a 3D comb beam, so we couldn't look at the airway. We weren't doing home sleep studies. Generally, we would send some of these patients to the sleep center, which were very few in the country, and they magically disappeared. They never came back. <laughs> So really? the sleep centers automatically put them on CPAP machines. So, so everything kind of changed uh, around 2000. Uh, and, and if you've read my book, you'll see in the story of my dad, um, he was a snorer. He was tested for sleep apnea. They said he did not have sleep apnea. Uh, shortly after, he died of a heart attack, sudden heart attack, which I feel was clearly related to that. Um, so um, that really was my journey into sleep apnea and sleep disordered breathing. So take a step back, Dr. Hal Huggins, after he told me about mercury, he said, oh, by the way, you're not going to like this, but root canals are not good either. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> start, go, start, start from scratch now. <laughs> yeah. So a whole new paradigm, no mercury, no fluoride, no root canals, looking at nutrition, looking at the TMJ, looking at orthopedics, looking at the airway. So all that has been an accumulation over this 40 years. So now we're practicing a much different way. We are very comprehensive. Um, and as a, in honor of my dad, whose name was Julian, we did name our center, the Julian yes, Center. I was, yeah, I was reading about that. That's so sweet. Like in honor, I was reading one of your, um, so what, I'm sort of, cut, was your father also a, um, a dentist? No, he was or not. He, he was in the insurance business. He was retired. Uh, he came to work for me uh, in the office doing the books and accounting, things like that. Just something to keep him busy. Mm -hmm. um, so I, he was actually in the office the day before he died of a sudden heart attack the next morning. Oh, no, I'm sorry yeah. to hear that. Yeah, so it was, it was quite an impact. And uh, that had another, obviously, pretty intense impact on my journey. So then I became very, very passionate about studying sleep apnea, sleep disorder, breathing, snoring, just kind of putting it all together. So, um, and, and it, it was all perfectly fit into what I was already doing. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, as a holistic dentist, how, how could I not be looking at airway? How could I not be looking at breathing? How could I not be looking at people's sleep? Uh, so important. Oh, so that, that kind of was the, I, I hate to say, I, I don't, his death was not in vain. It, so it really moved me in the right direction that I think we've saved a lot of other lives as a consequence of that. Absolutely. Thank you for uh, explaining that uh, so well. And, uh, you know, it, it's beautiful that what you're doing in inspired by an unfortunate event. And I, I could relate to that because my dad also um, passed of diabetes complications. I, we never imagined in a million years yeah. what would transpire with daddy. My dad was not o- overweight. My dad was uh, quite slim. And I've spoken about this in the past. He, I believe he had what's, what is it? Type th- either three diabetes where you're not overweight, but you still have it. So he uh, ended up with complications, amputation, horrible. I actually wanted to take my dad to the Whitaker Institute in, in California. Uh-huh. Uh, but unfortunately, financially, uh, we weren't able to, to do that. And I, I wanted to, so that's part of also my journey uh, because of what I've seen with my family, my grandparents, uh, you know, and so I think that's why you're here. It's very important that people know how crucial it is to have uh, optimal uh, um, dental health, uh, you know, if you will, uh, for, because it's linked to other diseases, which we're going to get to. Thank you so much. We're going to jump to the next question. And so what do you what I would like for you to explain to our audience the difference briefly between biological dentistry and conventional dentistry, which you already went into. Yeah, and, and I can jump into that a little, a little deeper um, perspective is that traditional dentistry is more focused only on the mouth and mostly on the teeth and the gums. Uh, they're not looking at, and I'm not saying this is all dentists, but it's really not part of the philosophy is how does the mouth affect the rest of the body and how does the health of the body affect the mouth? So when we look at that, we want to look at a patient's nutrition. So instead of saying, hey, you know what? You got a bunch of cavities. Let's just fill them. And uh, somewhere in the future, we'll probably have to fill them again. Uh, Let's look at your nutrition. Could your nutrition actually be what's impacting your dental health? So it's not about well, you need a new toothbrush, you need better brushing techniques, you need some kind of mouth rinse, you need to flaw. I'm not saying you shouldn't do those things. Um, but if you look at the work of Weston Price, when he looked at these native cultures, I mean, they weren't, they didn't have toothbrush and mouthwash and floss and electric toothbrushes. They didn't have all that. And they had perfectly formed jaws, perfect teeth, no cavities, no periodontal disease. So, so then from the oral perspective, we don't want to do anything that might have a potential effect on the overall body. So we talked about mercury amalgam. So amalgam has 50% mercury in it. Mercury is the most non-radioactive substance, most toxic non-radioactive substance on earth. Why in the world would we be putting it in patient's mouth? Okay. And in spite of what some dentists might say, it does continue to leak out of the amalgam the entire time that you have that. And it takes about 120 years for a half-life for it to disappear. So you'd almost have to live like 500 years before it was completely gone. But even if the amalgam was gone, the filling would completely collapse because understand it's 50% of the filling. So that's that's very important. So so we don't put amalgams in. We take them out. We take them out safely. We can talk a little bit about that in, in a second here. But the second thing, fluoride. Why are we using fluoride? Fluoride is toxic. Uh, Also, this is information that the the dental community will not admit to that as they will not admit to the mercury amalgam. Uh, There's plenty of studies, plenty of research to back up both of these. So I always say cavities are not a fluoride deficiency. So (laughs) cavities are due to poor hygiene and poor diet. That's what causes it. So why are we going to potentially put fluoride on the teeth, which may have some effect, but the potential of causing toxicity to the rest of the body. Yeah, I'm sorry to cut you off real quick. I need to address this. Um, you know how they, there's, because you are the person for this. 
Um, you know how they always say, well, in certain countries where their flu- the water is fluorated, their their teeth there's less cavities. In fact, one of my uh, a dentist that I saw a couple few months ago was so adamant about uh, fluoride, and he's almost about to start a a whole disagreement. I was like, listen, you know how how do you how do you feel about that? Like, what is when they say the argument of, well, countries who have fluorated water have much stronger teeth and blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, this is where the controversy comes into place. And uh, we could spend the whole podcast just on that. Um, initially, they looked at a couple of communities in Texas. Uh, one had uh, naturally occurring fluoride in the water, sodium fluoride, and they did, in fact, have less decay in their teeth. That was naturally occurring sodium fluoride. That's entirely different than yep. sodium fluoroxylic acid is what they put in toothpaste and mouthwashes and fluoride rinses for children and fluoride tablets. That is toxic. Sodium fluoride naturally occurring in the water does have some benefit without the side effects. So, so fluoride itself does have some benefits, but when you're talking about the fluoride that they're putting in toothpaste and mouthwash, that's very toxic. The benefits certainly do not outweigh the, I said the risk do not outweigh the benefits. Uh, I should say opposite. The benefits do not outweigh the risk. I I get it, yes. You got what I'm saying. (laughs) I get it. um, So there's definitely misinformation in regards to that. So we wanna be really careful about that. You know, here's a, a, a very important, information piece of information i haven't looked in a while but it used to be on the back of toothpaste you would say if swallowed call poison control exactly exactly so that should be a, that should be a clue right there and it's found in rat poison i <laughs> actually i actually i actually have a really good um infographic that i need that would kind of viral on pinterest fluoride is found in a lot of toxic products uh, out there so why would you put it in your mouth so yeah Thank you for answering that. Uh, let's go back to, okay, so you were explaining the difference. Are we, are you still? The difference yeah, that's between- kind of a, that's kind of a general overview. So, and I guess the next thing is, is looking at root canals. Are root canals really healthy for us? Again, going back to Western Price, he did a lot of testing. If you're familiar with that way, he took root canals from, from patients embedded them under the skin of rabbits and the rabbits died, died of whatever ailment the patient had. Right. I, so that's going to bring us to our next question. What are the dangers of root canals and what is the latest science on them in biological dentistry? Because when I say that is because as many of us know in our industry, uh, conventional dentistry uh, advocates for root canals. So yeah. uh, let's go back to that question. Yeah, so this was a very upsetting thing when Dr. Um, Hal Huggins said, oh, by the way, also root canals are bad. And I said, well, wait a minute, not, not my root canals. I do, you know, I do very explicit, very detailed, excellent root canals. <laughs> so I started to read the research from Weston Price, and then I was convinced. The dilemma was, now, how am I going to approach my patients, especially those who I've already done root canals on? to tell them that I now believe these are toxic. And then how do I go forward telling patients, well, there's no other good alternative other than an extraction. So no one wants to have their teeth extracted. I certainly don't want to take people's teeth out because that then generates other issues and collapse of the bite and jaw problems. Um, And we can go on and on about the potential issues long-term of losing teeth. But I said to myself, well, in 1940, Western Price, he didn't have lasers. He didn't have ozone. So I had studied with this dentist in California in the mid to late 90s. Started doing laser cleansing of the root canals, ozonating the canals, and putting in calcium hydroxide instead of the traditional gutta percha, which also happens to be toxic. Um, but I had no way of measuring, was this more successful? It appeared on the radiograph that it was healthier, but I needed some, you know, some kind of marker, biomarker to say this was actually effective. In that period of time, 
Dr. Boyd Haley came out with a test called Topaz. And that Topaz allowed you to test the root canal tooth or a tooth that you suspected was dead that might need a root canal for levels of toxicity. Oh, what wow. I found, every tooth, regardless whether it was a traditional root canal with gutta percha or one with calcium hydroxide, they were still toxic. No way. <laughs> still toxic. Interesting enough, that test was taken off the market. And I won't go into the conspiracy theory about why that happened, but anyway. <laughs> I could imagine pretty, pretty much, yeah. It wasn't till too much longer when uh, Dr. Hal Huggins came out, uh, bless his soul, he's passed away, with the DNA connections test. Also, an in intraoral test that you can test teeth and root canal teeth specifically, or even other areas of infection for as many as 96 different microbial strains, whether they're bacteria, virus, parasites, fungus. So now you could test the root canal and see if it was in fact healthy. So I have not seen one and none of my colleagues that do these tests have seen any that didn't come back with high risk microorganisms such as botulism, gangrene, E. coli, strep, staph, Klebsiella. I can go on and on of what we're finding around these teeth. So the important thing is- I'm sorry, I I'm sorry to, I, I just wanted to double check. You, you said that they found those types of- Yes, but that, this is what we're finding around root canal teeth. Oh my goodness. Wow, that's, in, that's pretty intense. So someone who is extremely healthy, good immune system, may not be an issue. Um, for others, the toxins that are produced by these microorganisms, and not to get too clinical, hydrogen sulfide, thioethers, mercaptans, all these things are toxic to the body. And the main place that they'll attack is our enzyme systems. So for example, when we're producing ATP, which gives us energy, it will break down that system and not allow you to build sufficient ATP. Now, from an energetic perspective, each tooth is on a meridian that affects different organs of the body. So if you have a root canal on the front tooth, that affects the urogenital. If you have one in the molar, upper molar, at, on the breast meridian. So, so on and so on. So, so there's an energetic connection and there's a physiological or biological, or let's say microbial connection. Um, so, that was in the 90s. Let's move forward now to the present day. What I'm seeing, and I saw it on an interview with Dr. Mercola, I won't say the dentist's name, but she is promoting the use of specific lasers and using ozone to what she's calling a biological root canal. I saw that interview. And yeah. I'm glad you're bringing it up because I actually brought it up to my biological dentist and a lot of people were talking about it. So I'm go, go on. This is very interesting. So I'm not going to say, because I don't have the evidence, that her technique is unsuccessful or successful. I can only say it's not much different than what I was doing back in the 90s and testing them. My question to any biological dentist who's following this protocol, make sure you're testing post root canal with the DNA test. So if you're doing this procedure and then test it with the DNA and it comes out negative, I'd say it's successful. I've not yet seen that evidence. They're saying it's successful, but what is the proof? You have to have the proof. So I would recommend anyone with a root canal do the DNA test, also test C-reactive protein and other cytokine markers to look for inflammation in the body. So you can't just say because it looks good on the x-ray and the patient's not in pain, that it is biologically acceptable. Now, if I was going to have a root canal, which I never would do, I would choose that method over the traditional method of cleaning it out with a little barbed wire and filling it with gutta percha. Right. Um, so let me ask you, because I was, 
actually, like we were speaking before the podcast, I was looking for a biological endodontist to potentially do this. And when you were saying about the, the how you use the laser and stuff like that, that interview immediately came to mind because I'm like, oh my gosh, I was just listening to that. You were doing this long before. But then now there is more things to it, you know, the, the, the DNA test and, and make sure that all those organisms are not there. So for someone who is looking to do, because I've had these questions with my followers DMing me, because I, I, I was talking about that. <clears throat> Where do I find a biological endodontist? So my, my biological dentist said, there's no such thing. And in fact, <laughs> here in New York, you can't find them. So I call it an oxymoron. <laughs> okay that's it doesn't name, make right? sense it doesn't Biological actually I, I exactly so i think i was the one that came up with the biological and the dentist so he so where, where do they go where does someone who because i had at least eight people asking me i don't want to have a root canal what do i do where do they go so i would uh take a step back and say okay i don't want one but i don't want to lose my tooth I would do this so-called biological root canal. I would definitely choose that over the other, but I would test with the DNA to make sure it's not causing you harm. Now, I still wouldn't advocate it because I haven't seen the evidence. I would take the tooth out, make sure it's taken out properly. This is also very important. When a tooth is extracted, the tooth is attached to the bone by the periodontal ligament. If the periodontal ligament is not removed and any necrotic bone, you are not going to get good healing. This is going to be a perfect area, nidus, for bacteria or other microorganisms to cause what we define as ischemic bone, or some may call it a cavitation. Uh, these are areas where there's poor blood flow. Again, has a similar effect on the body as a root canal because it's allowing this anaerobic environment. It's conducive to specific microorganisms. Those microorganisms produce toxins that can leak into your body. So cleaning it out properly, I always recommend we're going to fill that socket with PRP or PRGF. Or what does PR that stand for? I'm sorry. For PRP that. is platelet-rich plasma. I like, pla I like PRGF, platelet-rich growth factor. So we put that in the socket. It allows it to heal. So if you decide, well, one, it's going to prevent a dry socket, and two, if you decide you want to do an implant, you're going to have healthy bone there to do that. Um, and so then the, the third phase of that is, okay, now I'm getting an implant. I do not recommend titanium. Titanium can leach out. Uh, so that was one of, that was also a big issue for me. Like I'm taking teeth out. What am I going to put in place? So I would recommend generally like a removable partial or a bridge until zirconia implants came into place. And now that's what I generally recommend as the treatment of choice. Um, if you don't want to do an implant, there are other options, but it's a healthy choice. They're biocompatible. They're bioinert. They're aesthetic. They don't leach out. So, uh, so there's a good, healthy choice when you take a tooth out. Gotcha. So your, your choice, uh, your, your protocol of choice will be to remove the tooth safely if, if, if you require a root canal you prefer to remove the tooth and then do either an implant or other options versus working on this root canal with the laser in in in, in uh you know ozone therapy and things like that correct okay. and so it, i am going to uh address that with dr mccall <laughs> because he was very excited about it and everyone should be, but they did not address the fact that there are multiple, if not millions of tiny tubules or canals. Although they did talk a little bit about the interview, it's virtually impossible to get all of those and the surrounding periodontal ligament healthy. But let's say theoretically, hypothetically, that we could. Western Price, took teeth out, he sterilized those teeth, meaning he killed all the microorganisms, implanted them into the rabbit, and it still had the same effect. Yeah, so that's even, fascinating. Even if we are ozonating it, even if we are lasering it, you still have a dead organic matter that the body has to constantly keep its immune system in play 
to keep that thing under control. So in today's world where we have so many other toxicities we're dealing with, environmental and foods and stress, why do we want to add something to that to fill up our rain barrel and allow it to flow over when we have some other better options? So that's my personal professional opinion. <laughs> and I'm we could have a intelligent discussion with another so-called biological endodontist. <laughs> Excellent. That was an amazing explanation. I am super excited to learn about all this. And I'm sure my audience is as well, because there's so much out there uh, that people don't know. I want people to know that there are other options. And we are, I also became extremely interested in root canals because of the um, dangers behind it. I wanted to quickly ask you, I, I read uh, one of the studies, I believe, I forget when it was from, but the connection between the um, breast cancer for women and root canals where, and I always talk about this and a lot of my dentists, they're like, oh yeah, that study was, you know, whatever. But uh, they, they linked um, uh, in the study that some of the women who had root canals developed breast cancer in that part, in, on that side of the root canal. And so I wanted to hear your um, take on that. Yeah, a lot of that was the work done by Dr. Thomas Levy, uh, and he's written several several books. Very intelligent guy. He's a board certified cardiologist, internal medicine, and happens to also be a an attorney. <laughs> uh, so, and he will tell you without a doubt that these infected root canal teeth, if they're on the breast meridian, you have a high predilection for breast cancer. But just as well. If you have it on the front tooth, which is the urogenital, higher predilection for prostate cancer, uterine cancer, ovarian cancer. So these are the things that are connecting energetically. Um, again, nothing is 100%. So you could certainly have a patient with a mouthful of amalgams and even some root canals could live to 100 years old. I wouldn't, I, I think to me, that's like Russian roulette. Um, yeah. I, you know, you can also say, well, I don't have to eat healthy food. I could go to McDonald's every day, drink fluoridated water, and you might be an exception to the rule. But <laughs> I think in today's society, we have to do everything possible to keep ourselves as healthy as we can. So we're not becoming dependent on pharmacological intervention. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, we're already dosed with, you know, uh all kinds of pesticides and in and, and if we people some people don't believe in chemtrails but you know there's uh, xenoestrogens all of that so it is important guys i always talk about that uh in terms of do we we need to do the best we can to stay healthy because and, and try to stay a little bit ahead of the game yes and that's another thing that i wanted to talk about is uh i am i i've been an advocate for for many years signing petitions sharing information online to try to get these alternative treatments uh to uh to insurance companies and it's uh it's and we need your help to do this when i share those petitions and we you know raising awareness share all of this with other people because the more people who, who request them to potential insurance companies and use their services, you know, demand, right? Uh, right. And so we, we need this type of, of treatments, you know, we, we need more availability. And a lot of them sometimes it's out of pocket, but like I always tell you, and I just did this with myself, you know, yeah, out of pocket, but you know what? You're investing in your health. You're not spending money. Correct every little bit that you do. And so instead of buying that coach bag or choose whatever, I don't care about any of that. I look at organic food. I look at these type of treatments and anything that's going to help me because some, for, for some of us, we have genetic predisposition to other diseases and things like that. So um, anyways, let's- yeah. um, You're ahead. right on. That's exactly right. And if you don't take personal accountability, then you're putting your hands into a system that I would say, as many would, is broken. Yep. The medical system, unfortunately, is very broken. It's a, it's not a health system. It's a sick system. Exactly. It's trying to keep people alive with ever, any pharmaceutical that we can. 
Yeah, and it's obviously not conducive of anything. We've seen how our family members have unfortunately perished to this. I always talk about on all my podcasts is the reality, and I and I've never been afraid to say it. The pharmaceutical industry is profit over people. So let's move on to the next question because we have really good uh, topics to talk about. Uh, what is in one of your posts on Instagram? I found um, something really cool, and I wanted to talk about. Uh, mouth breeding. Um, <clears throat> so what is the best way to reduce mouth breeding and what tool or tools do you recommend, uh, you know, for this? Well, I think it requires um, a comprehensive evaluation of the patient or individual. And I'm, I'm a little bit leery about all I'm hearing about mouth taping. Um, <laughs> Because everyone's saying, oh, mouth tape, mouth, just mouth I was just, just going to ask you, what do you think about that? And, and, you know, keep telling us. So mouth taping is an excellent way to stop one from breathing through their mouth. Here's the caveat. <laughs> you got to make sure you can breathe through your nose first. <laughs> exactly. Don't close off the other source of oxygen if you can't breathe adequately through your nose. And so many people have nasal obstructions, deviated septum, polyps, um, uh, inflamed turbinates from environmental toxins and allergens, from food sensitivities, from food intolerances. They can't breathe adequately through their nose. So now you're gonna put tape over their mouth. I don't think that's a good idea while you're sleeping. So yeah, so I we wonder through. about that. Like how do, what if somebody's, you know, they always recommend the mouth taping and it's like, what if somebody can't breathe properly like right so so we're going to work first through the and it can be i mean you don't need to go to a practitioner can you breathe through your nose so i tell put your hand over your mouth block one nostril and see if you can breathe through the other one then do the opposite if you can then you get, then you're getting air through the nostril some people already know says no, i can't breathe you know or i say take a deep breath and you'll see one side collapse so we know they're not getting good air so uh, we're going to look at gut health and food sensitivities. We're going to mm -hmm. look at environmental toxins. And then we're going to suggest certain nasal therapies, such as some kind of spray, neti pot. And my, my favorite now is using a nebulizer with hydrogen peroxide. Get that gunk out of there. So the nose has a specific purpose and why you want to breathe through your nose and not your mouth. One. It filters out microbes. The mouth does not. So if you breathe through your mouth, you're breathing in whatever's in the air. So, oh, wow. So, um, two, it uh, humidifies the air. So, and the third thing, which probably may be the most important, it produces nitric oxide. So, that nitric oxide is what causes vasodilation of the cardiovascular cell or the arteries. So, that's very important. So, we've got to get somebody breathing through their nose. There are some techniques that you can do. Now, you could do mouth taping during the day to try to force you to breathe through your nose. Just don't do it at night until you're sure you can breathe through your nose. <laughs> yeah, it makes total so sense. You can use these things to clear out, look at, certainly do a food panel. You know, So if you're gluten sensitive, dairy sensitive, soy, whatever, you might have to eliminate those to get you breathing. There are things called nasal cones that you can actually put in the nostrils and open them up. So we've all probably heard of breath, breathe, breathe strips, which kind of yes. go over your nose. So here's a simple test. You just say, pull on each side of your nose and tell me if you can breathe better. If you can, we know we have an obstruction. So we can put cones up there. There's something called butico breathing, which is a technique that I teach patients that helps them to breathe better through their nose. And the technique real quickly is you take a deep breath in, you blow all the air out and then you hold your breath until you can't breathe. That produces carbon dioxide buildup. Carbon dioxide is what releases oxygen from the red blood cell. So if you do that throughout today, that will help you start breathing through your nose. If you've done all that and you're still like if at night, huh? <laughs> now it's time to take the take mouth. The mouth. <laughs> now you can take oh, the wow. mouth. So That's you're getting air through the nose, but don't tape the mouth if you're not sure you're getting adequate airflow through the nose first. 
because those are, you can't get air through your ear. <laughs> it's got to be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Last time we checked, you can't do that. Awesome. Thank you for answering that. Now let's move on to the next question, which is, I found it pretty fascinating. Uh, one of, again, you put one of your posts on the Julian Dentist account. It said on Instagram, uh, what conditions are, there was a post um, speaking about sleep disordered breathing. And mm -hmm. so I want to know what conditions are linked to that disorder in children and what is the best way to address that important issue? Yeah, so that's kind of a general term now. So sleep disorder breathing would, would involve any issues that children are having with their sleep. It could also be snoring. It could be mild, moderate, or severe sleep apnea. It could be upper airway resistance. All those come under the umbrella of sleep disordered breathing. Mm -hmm. Now, most of that focus now is when you say sleep disordered breathing, we're talking about children. So, and this was part of my journey again. So I'm treating adults for snoring, sleep apnea. And I said, well, wait a minute. These adults, they were children at one point. Where <laughs> during their lifetime did they suddenly become adult sleep apneic patients? Let's look back early on. And again, I'm going to refer to the work of Weston Price. Nice wide arches, great airways. They didn't have CPAP machines. They didn't need to have sleep apnea. So children now, for a number of reasons, one, C-sections, difficult births, not breastfeeding, and probably the most common, giving children soft, gooey foods instead of something hard to stimulate muscle activation, oh. mm -hmm. which will then stimulate bone growth. So wow. what we're seeing is, and I'm... I'm a victim of it. I was not breastfed, so I have this narrow jaw. I had orthodontics, I had to take out four teeth to make room. We're not doing that anymore. We can treat these children as young as two. And even before that, maybe they have a tongue tie so they can't breastfeed, they can't latch on. So you want to address the tongue tie. But these kids are, the common things are, they're snoring, they're grinding their teeth. Uh, the parents can hear them. They're wide open, their mouths are wide open while they're sleeping, they're restless, they're bedwetting, they have emotional issues, they have ADHD, uh, issues in school, learning disabilities, because they're not sleeping, and they're not sleeping because they're not breathing. So there are now appliances that can be used as young as two years old to help that individual start to develop. And the appliances, they chew on these just as they would food. Now we do want to talk to the parents and say, look, you need to get this child on food that are, that are causing stimulation to the musculature. But by the time they're two or three, it's a little bit late. They're probably already starting those foods. They need to do it as an infant. But you know, now we give these soft packed foods to children because mom and dad or mom is concerned they're going to choke on the food. They're not going to choke. It's, we, are not, we are able to eat foods like at our ancestors and generations have always eaten food as infants they didn't have these gooey things in packages so right so, so that all does that all ends up causing what we now define as sleep disorder breathing right uh, so uh, touching on that a little bit what is a good age for them to start you know chewing those foods so they start uh developing you know correctly and working on that uh, versus, you know, like you said, two, three years is too, too, too old. I remember I, I did that, you know, I gave my son, uh, obviously you got to be extremely vigilant. You got to be right there watching them, but he, I would always give them, uh, I started him with vegetables because I didn't want him to get with the sugar first. So he would get right. a taste of vegetables. And so I would give him a piece of, uh, whatever pepper, uh, right. yellow pepper, whatever, yeah. broccoli, you know, broccoli. whatever, something Argus. that requires him to chew. So as soon as the teeth start to develop, and certainly by the time you're weaning them off the breastfeeding, you want to start with good solid foods. So this is going to develop the jaws. This is exactly what Weston Price showed in all his studies and why these people did not have dental issues. So now, it's if when everyone, they... if everyone did that, we wouldn't need dentists. So. 
Right. So it's when they start, um, uh, when their teeth are start coming out is when you want to start doing that in. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right, yeah. parents, you're, you're listening to this. That's just that's excellent advice. I actually didn't know that it's fascinating on how a little, uh, something that is so easy could have such a big impact in, in, you know, in their health, in the dental health and health and overall health. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't give them something like a, a nut, you know, whether it's a cashew or something like that, but, you know, broccoli, asparagus, you know, certain. So, so now you're not just stimulating that musculature. You also give them good nutrients. Exactly. That's, that's required to build healthy infants. That's what you want. No yeah. doubt. And, 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 and as always use common sense, right? Don't give them something, that piece of meat that's going to. Something that could choke on. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. So, um, sleep disordered breathing where can someone go to find out about sleep disordered breathing obviously i'm going to link you for them to the lucky ones in maryland and actually i'm willing to travel to 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 get taken care of to have this taken care of but if somebody that's not in your area where can they go to find out whether you know about this uh disorder well, uh, if you're looking at sleep disorder breathing for children, uh, there's a number of organizations. The one that I follow is called the Healthy Start Program. Uh, I think that's um, a great place to start. There are some other uh, companies that are doing similar things with appliances. Um, the, Mayo, the Mayo Brace is one. Uh, I just happen to connect with the Healthy Start Program. And so they, they can certainly look up that online. If they go to YouTube and just put in Healthy Start. There's lots of videos on there that we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this is a early intervention. So here, so we talked about sleep disorder breathing. We talked about creating this nice wide arch. So what that's going to do, not only you're going to have a healthier child, they're not going to need braces. They're not going to need teeth extracted. And Optimally, if they get enough growth, they won't even need their wisdom teeth out, which has kind of been the common treatment for, you know, you got to get your wisdom teeth out. So think about the benefits of a program like this, not needing braces, although I have to laugh because some children, they want braces because their friends have them, but yeah. then <laughs> they once they get them, they want them off. So. They don't want how, they don't know how uncomfortable that is because I had my cousins always pulling and things like that. So, you know, that, that real quick, I also saw my goodness, this is so fascinating. We could have five podcasts and I'm sorry that I'm picking your brain, but I people need to know this. I noticed, which I think my son, unfortunately, um, he was a thumb sucker. Like we took his pacifier out and he replaced it quickly with the thumb. He just had this thing. Right. So I saw in one of your posts what you're talking about that you have a particular protocol that you use instead of braces. And is this the bio, uh, what is it called that you were talking about to widen the mouth and all of that? What do you, what do you use? Well, we would use the healthy start appliances. If the arch is extremely narrow, we may use a, what's called an alpha appliance or other, some kind of palatal expander. Um, we will probably include some cranial sacral work to get everything balanced. Um, wow. But if they're, so it's interesting, the thumb sometimes, the thumb is an orthodontic appliance. <laughs> <laughs> a really bad one at that. <laughs> it, but it could, but it could be more positive. But most of the time what happens is the arch forms around the thumb. So you can take the child's thumb and it fits right up in the palate. Perfect. Yes. So, um, so yeah, so you need to have some stimulation and intervention early on because you want to do this before the baby teeth, primary teeth fall out and the permanent teeth are trying to come in because then you don't have enough room. The permanent teeth don't have room to come in. They're coming in on the side. You go to the orthodontist and say, oh, we got to take these teeth out. You don't want to remove any permanent teeth and you want to have a nice wide arch. So, so no orthodontics, no extractions, hopefully can keep the wisdom teeth and then long-term not becoming an adult sleep apneic patient. And they're just going to be overall so much healthier. Absolutely. Wow. That's fascinating. I am so excited. I think I may have to bring my son 
uh, because, you know, they're looking at, at uh, braces and all kinds of things. And, and now that I found this, you know, I'm definitely going to look into it. Awesome. So let's see, we're going to go to um, the next question. So I was reading again, one of your phenomenal posts uh, about uh, the ABCDES of impaired mouth syndrome. <laughs> This, I found it fascinating. Why don't you tell us what that means, those letters, and uh, why is it important? Well, I'm going to first start by giving credit to my colleague, Dr. Felix Liao. He's the one who coined this, alignment, breathing, circulation, digestion, energy, and sleep. <laughs> so those are the A, B, C, D, E, S. So alignment. So we talked a little bit about that. So by doing early intervention, jaw alignment, TMJ alignment, the teeth come in in alignment, so they're balanced. Remember, the head sits on the shoulders, so you want to have good alignment of the spine. So if the spine alignment is off, that's going to throw the jaw off. If the jaw alignment's off, that's going to throw the neck off and work itself all the way down the chain. So wow. someone who has lower back issues, even someone who has knee pain, could be due to a misalignment of the jaw. So... That's the first thing. Breathing, we talked a lot about that. So sleep apnea and snoring. Um, having someone breathe adequately through their nose, not mouth breathing. Of course, circulation, uh, the, the direct connection between periodontal disease, root canals, and how it affects the heart and circulation, diabetes. So there's a connection there. Digestion, obviously, this is the first part of the digestive tract. So we need to be chewing our food adequately. Uh, digestion starts with carbohydrates in the mouth by producing salivary amylase. So it starts to break down your carbs. If you're not chewing your food because you never learned how to chew properly or you're missing teeth or your teeth are crowded, uh, you're going to end up swallowing a lot of your food whole. So that's going to affect the digestive system. Absolutely. Course, energy. We talked a little bit about infections and infections can affect the, how the blood flows through the body. We call this um, hypercoagulation. So think of blood as being kind of like a sludge working its way through, say, a pipe. You know, just like in your plumbing, the more sludge you have, the harder it is to move fluid or uh, water through there. Right. Uh, and then, of course, sleep affects so many systems from our immune system, our digestive system, our hormonal system. All these things are metabolism. Without sleep, I would say that is the foundation for everything else. I don't care how much you exercise. I don't care how well you eat. If you're not sleeping, you're not resting and breathing, then you're going to have health issues. So many things happen during the first part of the phase of sleep, which we call deep sleep. That's restorative sleep. That's when the body repairs itself. In the second part of that cycle or the end part of that cycle, which repeats itself every four or five times throughout the night, is our REM sleep. And our REM sleep is when we dream, we're paralyzed, but it detoxifies the brain. Oh, uh, wow. The brain has its own detoxification process. So you need to eliminate those toxins from the brain to clear the brain. Um, so... That's how it all ties together. So I thought it was very interesting what Dr. Liao did when he came up with this, you know, what he calls the holistic mouth. Yes, uh, that, that was pretty awesome. And I would probably, I really want to talk about the sleep, but that's probably going to be, if you're up to it, we could do a live and uh, we could talk about that and maybe a little bit of this too, because I don't, you know, I don't know how we are on time. We have one last question uh, and I don't know how are you on time with that? I I'm fine. You're good. Yeah. We could be here until 5 p.m. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> okay. I might have to say, cut you off before that. <laughs> but I'm no, good that's... till now. Okay, I'm good. perfect. I'm just kidding. Just one yeah, last I gotta, question. I got to head out about 12.30. Okay, so, so we have just one last question, and that said, um, and, and that question is related to, so how does nutrition impact our oral microbiome? Um, I was reading on your post, it says what you, what you, 
what, what you eat has a direct impact on your oral microbiome and risk for cavities. Dr. Weston Price discovered this in the 1930s when he looked at native cultures with exceptionally long uh, lifespans, nearly impeccable dental structure and health, and incredibly low levels of the chronic diseases that we now accept as part of getting older. The healthy diet included healthy protein and fat, along with complex carbs and fermented foods without any refined processed foods. So why don't you tell us, based on your experience, how important is nutrition to, towards healthy um, oral health? Well, I think it's, you know, it's the foundation, and I didn't want to downplay it by saying sleep is more important. It's still, it's, you still have to have good nutrition. <laughs> so you know, that's what builds the, that's the building blocks of all our cellular uh, metabolism. So we have to have good, healthy input. What we put into our body, you know, will determine the substructures of the cell. And so the, the mouth is no different. So the mouth, think about the mouth as the epithelium inside the mouth, which is similar to skin, continues all the way down through the digestive system and through the gut and out to the colon. So if we are not getting the proper nutrition, we are probably not building the proper microbiome. This is why probiotics have become so popular, which I would be a little bit hesitant because the bacteria or microbiome of the mouth is different than the microbiome of the gut, different than the microbiome of the colon. So if you're taking one probiotic, it doesn't work for all the systems, but mm. it starts here. So right. when we see lack of nutrition, the resiliency of the tissue, the epithelium inside the mouth breaks down. So you can have gum disease, bleeding gums, swollen gums. And then as we said, I said before, bleeding gums or periodontal disease can lead to diabetes and cardiovascular issues. Mm. Nut poor nutrition, so not getting vitamin D3, K2, fermented oils, calcium and magnesium, and some minor things like biotin and silica, those all help build strong teeth. So all that can have a deleterious effect causing cavities, periodontal disease, loss of teeth, need for root canals, need for extractions. So you can see there's a, without the proper nutrition, somewhere down the road, things are going to break down. And I remember, I, I remember this clearly because I said, well, maybe genetics has something to do with it. Well, I think We've shown that genetics is about 5%. Epigenetics is what really determines. So that's what we do, our lifestyle. And I remember I had early in my career, twin sisters. Okay, so similar genetics, similar environmental um, background, but one of them was super meticulous about brushing and flossing and doing everything she could to keep her oral microbiome healthy. She always had issues. Sister number two, good, clean diet. <laughs> that, you just, yeah. Actually, her oral hygiene was not that good, but she had more resiliency. Oh, so, wow. And I think that's what Weston Price really showed is that the nutrition. So we've gotten caught up in the advertising world about how important certain brushes and certain toothpaste and certain mouthwashes and you know, all these things that will whiten and beautify our teeth. And at the same time, when the next commercial is about fast food. <laughs> so you're watching TV and they're like, oh, wait, well, you need fluoride, you need this mouth rinse. And then the next commercial is about, oh, you can get a special two for one whopper, you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh, hello, how are we supposed to, right? It just doesn't make sense sometimes. Or with the same thing with the medication for whatever, like, you know, use this medication for anxiety. But then at the end, it's like, well, you might commit suicide. And also you might have a heart attack and then stroke. And it's like, uh, no, <laughs> that's not I'd rather working. deal with the initial <laughs> problem. <laughs> right. Then the potentially. Right. So I was going to ask, uh, what would be one or a couple of foods that you would recommend to always include? I, I, you said silica and vitamin D3 and stuff like that. So what are like, what would be like one or two foods that you absolutely recommend uh, your patients and my audience to always have on hand to, to try to maintain oral health? I know there is more, but just a couple. Uh, 
Well, any any of the green vegetables are obviously very effective in terms of nutrients. And of course, you want to you want to go organic. Um, you want to include fats in your diet. Okay, fat does not mean causing overweight. We need we're made of proteins, fat, and carbohydrates. So low fat diets have shown to cause more problems. Yeah. And and many of the people who were on low fat diets had lots of cardiovascular issues. So, yeah. so you want to include things like avocados. Excellent. I, w- I mean, if you're asking like, if there was one food and I could only eat one food, <laughs> probably an avocado. Oh, they're so wholesome. I think it's like the perfect food. I know it's a beautiful, it tastes delicious. They're wholesome there. They have fiber. They have the good fats. They have, you know, everything. They're, they're beautiful. Okay, great. Yeah, that would be my number one choice. I would have some source of protein, okay? Now, if you're vegan, um, you're going to look for choices for with soy. I, I'm not a big soy fan. Um, again, if we're eating some type of protein like meat, make sure it's grass-fed, grass-finished beef, okay? Yeah. And then carbs, just stay away from anything in a package, <laughs> Eat real, eat real food. Yeah. Uh, and then without getting too much into the weeds, I mean, there are healthy foods that can be problematic for some people. So, and so unless you've tested done a food sensitivity test, you might not know maybe you are sensitive to avocados or almonds or something else that you, we consider on the healthy list. So you want to do testing. Um, we don't know without doing the test. Um, looking at what affects your blood sugar levels. So there are tests now, and actually I have one right here on my arm. Uh, continuous glucose monitor. Yes. So How did I you don't... get your hands on that? Because my insurance, I've been fighting, and I'm actually a candidate because I am literally pre-diabetic. I've been fighting my genetics, my grandparents, my parents. I talked about the last podcast, so I'm not going to get into it, but I was a former athlete. I walk. I'm. I was. I'm, I was walking during the pandemic, and I was. I walk in the winter. I go to the gym. I walk in 20 degree weather when everyone's chilling on the couch. I'm out there because I have. Uh, I had a predisposition, and still, uh, with that, you know, with the with the sugar thing, how do how can people get? Is that out of pocket, or does insurance cover? Well, this is part of a program by a company called Levels L E V E L S. They have a beta program, so I was able to get it as part of their testing because I'm oh, not yeah. pre diabetic. I don't have any diabetes. I wanted to see what things would elevate my sugar, stress, working out, not sleeping, uh, certain foods. You know, I noticed that like if I eat, if I eat blueberries, it'll, it, my sugar level will go up. But if I eat blackberries, it does not. Oh, that's inter- That's why I want, I want to get my hands on that because I know for a fact what, what can potentially, because of, I've also tested since I was like 18 years old. Pre uh, testing because both my parents were so I would use their machines whatever, and I was always so fearful of it. And finally, after forty, I start, my numbers started creeping up. I was and just so people know, I was going to the gym five times a, a week. I was there for almost two hours or more, including sauna and sometimes the, the jacuzzi, whatever. But I was doing intense, and that actually backfired because. Uh, my cortisol level shot through the roof. I didn't know that. I thought that the more you work out, the more, the better. And it- No, not necessarily. Yeah. It backfired. You could be be stressing the body out more. Oh, I totally did. My cortisol, like I'm still trying to low, dealing with that cortisol issue. And then I have sleep issues, but all that. So um, what was I going to say? When you said, I was going to ask you, you you said something about the, to close off the probiotics uh, for the microbiome. I make my own kefir and I was reading somewhere or listening to uh, one of the one, uh, Dr. Stacy or, uh, or asked the dentist about, ke- I don't know if it was with them kefir. And I actually sometimes kind of rinse my mouth with kefir, right? And yeah. I do coconut oil, oil pulling, and I add a couple of drops of oregano oil here and there, you know, whatever. But what are the probiotics that you recommend that you recommend are better for oral 
for the oral microbiome? Well, there's, there's, there's a number of companies out there. Uh, Seed is one of them. Uh, and they make it one for men and one for women. Seed, um, that does sound seed. Yeah, S-E-E-D, yeah. Uh, Designs for Health makes a number of probiotics that I think are really good. Um, I, I, if you don't want to try to figure that out, one thing I do on a regular basis, I chew sauerkraut. <laughs> and not just eat it, but I chew the heck out of it before I swallow it. So I'm flooding my mouth with probiotics and prebiotics. That's excellent. Have you yeah. tried the kefir? Yeah, kefir. I'm a big... Uh, kombucha fan i have you know what i i used to make my own kombucha just so you know because i go hard or go go home i got my scoby you know uh you guys scoby, know yeah. that i i the symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast and i still have the mother somewhere and i used to make my own kombucha but my, one of my dentists told me that that was one of the reasons why he thought and you probably could debunk this because a lot of my followers are uh, fermenters that kombucha, the acidity in kombucha was what affected my teeth uh, a couple of years ago. So I yeah. started drinking it with a straw, but I don't know. How do you feel about kombucha and, or, and for your oral health? Well, there are, there are people whose teeth become very sensitive from kombucha because of the acidity. I recommend for those people or anyone who's concerned about it, you could drink through a straw or after the kombucha, just take good, clean, filtered water, swish it around and spit it out. One thing you do not want to do after drinking something acidic is to brush your teeth because that, that is the most vulnerable time to break down the enamel. So the enamel will remineralize on itself from your saliva. So, but if you want to get the acid off, just rinse with water. Don't brush teeth for maybe half an hour, an hour. Yeah. But people wow. drink kombucha, then they go brush your teeth. That's the worst thing you can do. I think I used to do that. Yeah. <laughs> So, so don't do that. Now, now we know not to. Okay, excellent. Well, guys, this um, basically concludes our podcast. Is there anything you wanted to close with before I go ahead and tell them how they're going to get in touch with you and everything else about your website? I'd say just um, be proactive. It's, it's your health. It's your body. Don't let anyone else tell you what to do. But be careful about being overloaded with too much information. Oh <laughs> so, yeah, that is that is. So amazing. verify before you jump into anything, but um, stay as natural as you can. You know, eat whole foods, get sunshine, go for a walk. These are important things, and sleep. Make sure you're getting adequate sleep. That is a big one that a lot of us are dealing with. That was beautiful. Thank you so much for um, all, sharing all of your wisdom with us, your knowledge. I am super thankful. Hopefully I could have you again. But guys, before we close, I wanted to let you know that uh, you, how you know that I have a dedicated page for you on my website with the podcast and all of your information, all of the links and show notes. But don't forget to visit, interact and tell Dr. Dean and tell him that you learned about him via my podcast. His websites are Julian Center for um, Effortless Sleep. Effortless Sleep. And that link is then that's the link, right? Yep. The link is mm -hmm. Julian Center for Sleep.com. And also there is uh, Julian Dental.com. You could visit both. He has um, a link on his Instagram account. He is pretty active on LinkedIn under what is the name on LinkedIn? I think it's Dr. Gene. It is. Uh, yeah, I think it's Dr. Gene. You're right. Gene and also on Instagram, uh, Instagram yeah. is uh, biohacking biological dentist. Right. And also there's the Julian dentist. Uh, that is also the, 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 the handle, which I'm going to add it to the notes. So you don't have to worry about that. Also, I will be adding a link to his book, which is called uh, Stop the Snore. Correct? Yes. Yes. And, and so where can they find this book, Dr. Gene? Uh, it's on Amazon. On Amazon. Yeah, okay. And um, um, 
what is it? Um, what's the other bookstore? Barnes and Noble. Barnes and Noble. That one. Okay. Yeah. And on your website, right? They could find it. Yeah. Also, don't worry about it. I'm going to put a link to it on my YouTube channel on the video. You, you'll find it also on my website. So you could get a, a copy of his phenomenal book. And um, so you could learn some more, follow him on, on his social media platforms because he, they're constantly pumping good information. So thank you so much again for your time, for being here. It's an absolute thank pleasure. You. And we're going to be looking uh, to see if we do that live so you guys stay tuned because it's going to be awesome uh you know if dr gene is available and uh so looking forward to having you again oh thank you so much for your time and i uh, and bless you for all the work you're doing thank you i appreciate the kind words and looking forward to having you again yeah okay well have a great day thank you you too